wonderful to have with us. Yes, <laughs> to have with us um, Catherine Kingfisher, who's written a fabulous book, if you're interested. And uh, we received the, uh, I think, the visuals in the general um, notice about this meeting. Um, Catherine is um, Professor Emerita of Anthropology at the University of Lethbridge, but is now living in the Quayside co-housing community. And she studied it before she joined it. Which, which is an interesting progression. Mm -hmm. So she will talk to us today about Keysight and about the book, um, so uh, conjunctions and comparisons with other co-housing models. And uh, then we'll have time for discussion. So Catherine, welcome. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. And uh, thanks to Sneja for inviting me. And Christina, for she's going to manage the slides because my computer is not up uh, to the task. So uh, as Sneja... Sneja explained it to me that I should talk for about 20 minutes and then we can have uh, some discussion. So I want to spend my 20 minutes talking about um, two urban co-housing communities, one in North Vancouver and one in Tokyo, and then I'll leave it to you to determine um, the direction of our discussion. And I want to do two things in my 20 minutes. First, I want to illustrate the flexibility and adaptability of co-housing. And I'll do this by outlining the similarities and differences between the two communities in relation to both philosophy and practices of governance. Second, and more briefly, I wanna frame co-housing in general as a particular form of utopic practice. As you can see on the next slide, um, urban co-housing is one of a number of types of intentional communities including eco-villages and spiritual communities, which are the most common um, in the world and perhaps have the deepest history. Hippie communes, which still exist, uh, like the farm in Tennessee, although a number have morphed into eco-villages. Kibbutzim, senior retirement communities, disability communities, and my focus, um, urban co-housing communities. Um, on the next slide, I've outlined uh, characteristics that make urban co-housing communities unique relative to other forms of intentional community. The first is that they're geographically integrated with society at large in contrast to, for example, eco-villages and some spiritual communities, many of which are geographically removed uh, from mainstream society. Second, they're usually deliberately cross-generational, uh, most notably in contrast to retirement communities. And finally, they make space for the private and individual as well as the collective in contrast to some religious communities and eco-villages. So in many ways, although <laughs> urban housing communities arise like other intentional communities from critiques of current social arrangements and utopic desires for something better, they remain fundamentally engaged with society at large. So I wanna just give you a very brief uh, background on each community. Uh, Keyside Village in North Vancouver and Konkanmori in Tokyo are the first purpose-built urban uh, co-housing communities in their city. So the next slide um, is a picture of me, uh, there we go, is a picture of me um, arriving at uh, Konkanmori. Konkanmori occupies uh, two floors of a 12-story building in downtown Tokyo. It has 36 people living in 28 units. And this is a really interesting building. So the bottom floor houses a kindergarten and a cafeteria for the top nine floors, which is uh, houses a retirement community. The next slide is of Keyside Village in North Vancouver. It's a um, four story building with 19 residential units and one commercial unit. The commercial unit is now occupied by a cafe, which is very convenient for many of us. Um, it has 19 units and 29 people living in those 19 units. Keyside is about to celebrate its 25th anniversary and Konkanmori is in its 20th year. By purpose built, I mean that in both cases, a group of people got together with architects to design spaces that allowed for a balance of independence and interdependence. And the result in both communities is a built environment that provides residents with their own private apartments complete with kitchen and bathroom, but that also has a range of shared spaces, a common kitchen and dining area, gardens, laundry room and play areas for children. And you can see these 
uh, this balance of interdependence, interdependence and independence in the, the layouts. Um, Christina has already put the one from Keyside Village up. It's kind of hard to see here, but if you look to the left top corner, that little constellation there is, uh, it's the common kitchen and dining area. There's a common guest room, bathroom, a shared office, a children's play area, and the shared laundry room. And then the rest of these uh, drawings are of the, the units, which are kind of arranged in a horseshoe fashion around an internal courtyard and the, um, the common space. And the next slide is of Konkan Mori's first floor. And it's very similar. So again, the top left side, you'll see a common, there's the common dining room and common kitchen. There's a library, an office, uh, there's a deck for people to hang out on or eat when there's too many people in the common room. And if you look a little bit to the right of that down, just below the number four, that kind of black area is the common uh, laundry room. Um, and across the hall from that up a little bit and to the right, there's a workshop, that's where number five is uh, for woodworking. Uh, number seven, over a little bit to the right, is another play area for children. And then number six to the far right is um, uh, the gardens, the community gardens. So next slide, please. Um, despite their locations in very different societies, uh, Konkan Mori and Keyside share a number of features. First of all, both are self-governing, so that means that all decisions about community issues like garden usage, community expenditures, and social events are made collectively. Second, they both work to address environmental issues by means of pooling, so buying in bulk, a vegetable garden that produces vegetables that can be used for common meals, shared laundry facilities, uh, shared tools, so on and so forth. Sharing resources also helps out economically, although there are limits to this, and I'll get back to that point later. Third, as you might expect, in both communities, interaction among residents is intense. There's constant interaction in common spaces, endless social events, helping events like work parties to clean up the gardens, for instance, uh, taking care of the community events, and lots of interaction on listservs. Joint activities, moreover, aren't confined to the physical boundaries of, their, of the community. Residents go out to restaurants and cultural events together. They engage in political activities together and so on. Nevertheless, these aren't communities in which people have no privacy and in which social interaction is obligatory. There's some quite private people living in both communities and different members engage socially to different degrees at different times. So the intensity of interaction is organic and naturally occurring rather than forced. A fourth noteworthy feature of these communities is their diversity. Both Keyside and Cancun Mori work to create uh, family ties or extended family ties, tight, tight, you know, related ties, but, and this is key, in altered form. Since in both cases, diversity of things like age, background, profession, religious, spiritual orientation, sexuality, so on, is considered a keystone. So although there's a shared philosophy of collective living, no one's interested in living in a community of people just like themselves. As one person at Konkan Mori put it, the community is interested in creating bonds not based on blood. Another resident, describe the community as neither friends nor family, but something different, something new. And I'll return to this point later. So this isn't just about nostalgia or an attempt to go back in time. It's also, and perhaps more so, about grafting ideas about past ways of living that were less isolating with contemporary realities and aspirations. There are, however, currently severe limits to this diversity. Both communities remain class-based. You have to have money to move in, even into key size affordable units. We have four affordable units here, but they're at 80% of market rate, right? Which means it's unaffordable for many people. There's also limited diversity in relation to ethnicity and ability, despite residents' desires otherwise. So the, the economic benefits of sharing resources only come into play if you have the money to move in in the first place. 
Finally, to return to the point about design that I made earlier, this something different, something new, reflects the explicit desire to balance interdependence and independence. The goal of Keyside Village and Konkanmori residents is not to participate in communities simply in order to boost one's personal level of happiness. So it's not about getting at the self via the detour of the other. And people have said this to me explicitly. This is a slight but significant difference between how community is thought of in these contexts and how positive psychology, for instance, sometimes pitches community involvement. In places like Keyside and Konkan Mori, the goal is to build a healthy community with a capital C. That is the community that is one Konkan Mori resident put it is a basic characteristic of humanity. So in this framework, one wouldn't do volunteer or community work only to feel good, but because it needs to be done, because people need help. That's what it means to be human. Feeling good may be a wonderful side effect, but it's not the main purpose. And similarly, one doesn't invest in relationships in, a, in an instrumentalist way, but engages in them because connection is, again, a basic characteristic of humanity. This community with a capital C, though, is not about reducing or eliminating the autonomy or integrity of the individual. Instead, the two are seen as inextricably tied as part and parcel of each other. All of these features are captured in the community's official guiding philosophies, which are quite similar. So the next slide um, lists Konk and Mori's three core intentions, which are to share space and time with others, to have independent and private space, as well as communal space, and to spend time together in common activities. They also have a number of additional principles, which I list on the following slide. Everyone needs to cherish their own independent life as well as sharing. Everyone from single people to large families can enjoy Konkan Mori. Living at Konkan Mori needs to be both practical and ecological. Life needs to be open to the outside world. And there needs to be a focus on communication and diversity. We need to grow and learn from each other. Keyside's value in many ways mirror Konkan Mori's additional principles, as you can see on the next side. They focus on environmental stewardship, trust, communication, camaraderie, and community engagement. On the next slide, um, I just list two additional patterns that I noticed in the course of my research. The first is that in addition to, or as part of this something different, something new, a number of resident stories reveal a relationship between moving into co-housing and re-evaluations of life as a whole that entailed criticisms of the idea of well-being as something exclusively subjective. Some residents changed jobs and reassessed friendships with people who they now felt were overly focused on individual achievement and acquisition. Others altered the relative weighting of various activities in their lives, devoting more time to being with others and spending less time on their own or on seeking material goods and personal advancement. These rethinkings and reconfigurations reflected residents' ongoing efforts to create a mutually beneficial harmonization of the personal and the collective, neither of which would trump the other. The point here is that living in a co-housing community actually changes people. It's, so it's not just a place to live, but a way of life. The second pattern is that, of course, neither of these communities is a completely harmonious environment. Residents' participation in community endeavors waxes and wanes, and everyone struggles to navigate the relationship between what they see as the community and what they consider to be personal or private. Residents sometimes experience difficulties balancing their lives inside the community with their lives outside of the community, and inside the community with balancing their private lives with their participation in the collective aspects of the community. These tensions inevitably lead to disagreement and conflict, typically focused around the relationship between the individual and the collective, or how to allocate shared funds or how to arrange shared space. But despite these struggles, residents claim that the benefits of living in a co-housing community far outweigh any inconveniences that might accompany it. As one person told me, quote, it's more fun to live with more people. And to return to the point about reevaluations of life as a whole that I made a minute ago, many residents recognize the benefits of learning to be less self-referential and more other focused. They, they report feeling more well-rounded. 
after uh, living in co-housing for a while. So I'd like to switch now with the next slide to look at some of the differences uh, between Keyside Village and Konkanmori. One of the reasons I chose to work in these specific communities is that they're located in very different kinds of societies. Keyside Village is situated in a society that has an ideological emphasis on the individual, while Konkan Mori is located in a society that has historically emphasized the collective. So not surprisingly, although they share the same philosophy, there are some significant differences in how this philosophy plays out. A key difference has to do with the use of space. Space is arranged in somewhat similar ways in each community, as you could see from the, the floor plans that I showed you, but it is used very differently. In Konkan Mori, there is a much sharper distinction between personal and public space relative to Keyside, where the boundaries are much more fluid. Keyside residents visit each other's private spaces regularly for dinner, coffee, or to borrow things, sometimes borrowing something from someone's place when they're not even home. And to give just one notable example of the fluidity of boundaries at Keyside, during the six years when I was doing research, I often stayed um, at my friend Kathy's house here. She, Kathy is one of the, um, Christina knows Kathy. She's one of Keyside's founding members and she's a hub of the community. And her apartment is centrally located on the bottom floor near the common room. More than once while I was sitting at her dining table writing field notes, another resident would just walk in and use the bathroom and then leave. They, you know, had wanted, they were leaving the building. They had wanted to use the common bathroom next to the common room, but somebody was in it. So they just walked into Kathy's place and used it. Um, Kathy also on occasion would come home and one of her daughter's friends would just be hanging out there or had just used the bathroom on their way home. They decided they had to pee and they didn't, you know, before they could get home. This is a kind of an extreme example. It, it certainly wouldn't happen in all the units at Keyside Village, but it definitely would never, ever, ever happen in Konkan Mori, where people tend to restrict their interactions with each other to common space. Indeed, many of Konkan Mori's residents, some of whom have known each other for over a decade and you know, know each other quite well, have never been inside each other's apartments. This difference in the use of space may seem minor, but it's a little difference that really matters in terms of the experience of collective living. And that is clearly tied to general cultural differences between Japan and Canada in terms of how people negotiate space and social relations. My second example has to do with decision-making processes. At community meetings at Keyside, airing personal feelings and expressing dis disagreement and expressions of intense emotion are seen as, as good, however difficult they may be in the moment. The idea here is that stuff is put out on the table and people can talk through it and then come to some kind of compromise. This fits in very well with a cultural system in which suppressing emotions is generally viewed as unhealthy, the kind of hydraulic view of emotion that if you keep it inside, eventually you'll explode. At Konkan Mori, in contrast, the airing of strong personal feelings and conflict is not considered useful or to the benefit of the community at all. The focus instead is on harmony, on following protocol, and on the good of the community, which can be sabotaged by conflict and the expression of strong emotion and individual desire. So again, you can see cultural difference at work here. My last example has to do with governance. You'll remember I said earlier that both communities are self-governing. And so in both cases, there are committees that deal with different aspects of running the community. But again, this plays out really differently. At Konkan Mori, during the course of my research, there were some 22 committees, uh, orientation committee, public relations, research method, research relations, neighborhood association, handbook, gardening, guest room, events, fire prevention, just a ton. And every adult member was obliged to participate in two of those. And they were also obliged to participate in preparing one common meal a month. In contrast, at Keyside Village, there are only five committees, finance, gardening, uh, maintenance, and a couple others. And residents are not obliged, but invited to participate. And the same goes for common meals. So, 
as people from Konk and Mori and Keyside learned about each other, a lot of people at Konk and Mori had a hard time imagining how they would live in a place that seemed just like totally chaotic, um, astructural, um, no sense of obligation, no sense of fairness, because not everybody participates to the same extent. At the same time, residents of Keyside had a hard time imagining how they would cope in a situation that was so rigidly structured in their view as Konk and Mori. So again, you can see cultural difference at work here. So regardless of how much they share in terms of their model of collective living, co-housing communities all look different on the ground as the models are adapted to local cultural contingencies. So the point here with the next slide is that co-housing as a model that addresses social and environmental sustainability is profoundly flexible and adaptable. If we can figure out how to scale it up to accommodate socioeconomic variation, it has the capacity to accommodate a range of cultural contexts as well as the proclivities of its residents. In other words, it's, it's changeable um, and adaptable. Um, so if I can have the next slide, uh, Christine, thanks. Um, I want to end with a point about utopia. In contrast to some other forms of intentional community, co-housing is not about utopia as a fait accompli from the beginning, but about utopia as something unfolding and that we're heading towards. And this contrasts with other types of intentional communities like some religious and spiritual communities or kibbutzim and so on, along with you know, Marxist inspired utopian socialisms, that attempt to put fully formed utopias into practice from the very beginning. The problem with uh, some of these is that it makes space for authoritarian tendencies and many of them fail because there, there's this expectation that people will totally, total, totally change how they are in the world. Instead, providing examples of what feminist philosophers would refer to as utopia as method, utopia as practice or everyday utopia Co-housing communities represent strivings that residents recognize as flawed, dynamic, and emergent. So the goal here is to work with what is available to head not in the direction of the perfect life, but in the direction of a good life. So co-housing is both imaginary and practical, fantastical and realistic. And this I think is what gives it its power as a viable, actually workable alternative to social isolation and environmental uh, degradation. So I'd like to finish with just a few slides of what everyday life looks like in these communities. So this slide is of a community meeting at Konk and Mori, and you can see that it's a quite formal arrangement of space, and it looks quite uh, business-like, uh, and it doesn't look like something that would be conducive to emotional outbursts, for instance. It's very organized, very formal, and actually on the agendas, which you know everybody gets a hard copy of the agenda, each item is actually allocated a certain number of minutes for its discussion. The next slide is of a community meeting at Keyside Village, which you can see is organized in a much more informal way. There's even a dog uh, joining the discussion. And there's lots of room in these meetings for emotional expression, sharing, individual desire, disagreement, conflict, so on and so forth. The next slide is of um, the next two slides, but the, are about the intergenerational aspects. So this one, um, this is Carol McQuarrie, who is a founding member of Keyside Village, heavily involved in the labor movement and feminist movement. Um, before found, uh, helping to establish Keyside Village. She's 87, just turned 87 last week. And she's holding the baby of another co-houser from another community who came for a common meal. And the next slide is of uh, Yutaka-san in his late 80s at Konkan Mori, who is feeding Toma, who was uh, the youngest member of uh, Konkan Mori at the time. Uh, the next slide is gardening at Keyside Village. So the gardens at Keyside Village are individuals uh, grow what they want and eat what they want, but they often put out uh, items to share. They'll just put it in the common room and people can take it or use it, uh, use the stuff for common meals. 
And the next slide is of gardening at Konkan Mori. They have quite an extensive garden on a terrace um, along with a, a composting system. Uh, the next slide is of mochi making at uh, Konkan Mori. This is a traditional Japanese thing done for the new year. And it's just one of many uh, social events at Konkan Mori. The next slide is of a common meal preparation at Konkin Mori. So the woman with her back to the camera and the red apron is Sakamoto-san, who was one of the founding members of uh, Konkin Mori. And like Carol McCory at Kisai, was heavily involved in the feminist movement and the anti-Vietnam War movement, uh, anti-Narita Airport movement. One of her agendas in helping to establish Konkan Mori was to get men uh, more involved in domestic activities. And here is an example of that, two men preparing a common meal. The next slide is of a common meal at uh, Konkan Mori. And there's a bunch of tables to the left uh, that you can't see because there's usually um, quite a few people at common meals. And the next slide is of a common meal at Keyside Village. Um, the next slide is a drinking party at Konkan Mori. So after uh, common meals at Konkan Mori, after everybody has helped clean up, usually people will bring out alcohol and uh, uh, snacks and these little drinking parties can go on until one or two in the morning and are lots of fun. And finally, the last slide, uh, something I didn't talk about is uh, the exchange that I built into the project. So one of the things I did for this work was bring uh, people through, I bought three people from uh, Keyside Village to Konkan Mori for 10 days. And then a family of four, including the two little girls on the right in this photo uh, from Tokyo to Keyside Village for 10 days. So they could learn about each other and share experiences. And that is it. Uh, I think I've stayed within my 20 allotted minutes and I'm happy to talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. Thank you. You're muted, Sneja. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. And uh, that was extremely helpful. And um, I think we'll do the usual that people put up their hand if they want to ask a question. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, there was uh, the elderly gentleman who's 87 and an yes. um, uh, older person in Keyside. What happens when they're no longer able to manage, you know, in, in that housing? What happens to their their yep. flats. Yep, very good question. Um, both communities, and I write about this briefly in the book, have yet to um, have to really deal with that because they're young enough. But um, at Konkan Mori, some of the people there, like Yutaka-san and Sakamoto-san, have the idea that they might then move upstairs into the retirement community where they could get, you know, um, uh, assisted living um, if they wanted it. There is one person at Konkan Mori, um, older person who died, but she died very quickly. And so never, you know, we never had to, you know, they never had to deal with how are we going to deal with this? And we have had conversations here at Keyside about what's now called aging in place. And you know, there's there's recognition here that we can do things to help each other out. So people hear uh, somebody had a heart attack last year and we helped them out. Um, somebody got in a in a bike accident, and broke her pelvis. So for two weeks had to stay in the guest room because she couldn't go upstairs so people can bring meals. We we take care of each other in that sense. But there is also a recognition that there are limits to that. Like we're not equipped to deal with somebody with severe dementia. We're not equipped to deal with somebody who is bedridden and needs help to go to the bathroom or bathe. And so in the end, I think it comes down to individual decisions that people have to make about their care. 
Um, there have been discussions in, I think, in some co-housing communities on the island of, you know, can we have a guest suite that would be for a live-in carer? Um, so that's another possibility. But basically, you know, neither Konkanmori nor Keyside Village is equipped to deal with somebody, you know, who is severely disabled by by illness or age. Mm -hmm. I, I was also thinking, what happens to the apartment or the suite? Okay, so so Keyside Village is um, an owner based community, um, and so our it's private property, and we it treated like any private property. Konkanmori is a rental based community. And so people usually sign three year uh, rental agreements, which they can, you know, renew as, as far as they like. So, so even though they, these are co-housing communities, it's treated like private property, your unit or the rental unit is just a regular rental unit. Mm -hmm. So here it would be sold. Um, yeah. Conk and Maury, they would move out and somebody else would, would move in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? I've got my hand up, but the oh, yeah. background is yellow, yeah. so hard to see. Oh, I'll yeah, now I see. Yeah. yeah. I'll have to paint the wall. Um, <laughs> this might be um, too long of a question, so answer it in any way that you feel. But what I'm really interested in is uh, the founding members and um, how did they get together? Um, like what kind of a collective came together to plan this? Clearly you need people with different backgrounds, but it wouldn't just be people off the street or you right. know, putting a call out. So are you able to talk about that yeah, for yeah, Keyside? Yes. Yep, yep, I can. So Keyside um, was, so Kara McQuarrie, the, the woman holding the baby there, she and three other people, and she just met them through, she, you know, she was involved with the North Shore Women's Center, friends, and she just, she was getting ready to retire. She was, you know, getting, creeping up to her 60s and decided she wanted to be around other people. So the four of them got together and had a presentation by someone from Winsong, which is a community out in Langley about co-housing and decided they wanted to give it a try. They threw in money, their own money, um, and got a lawyer who, and they were they were originally um, treated with some disdain. It was all women uh, by this lawyer who thought, you know, you didn't know, you don't know what you're doing. But anyway, so they formed a kind of corporation and they, they put out calls, uh, flyers and, it kind of snowballed and did it. They bought a piece of land. There were three houses on this property and they hired an architect. People have had to put in money um, in advance to get it up and running. When they moved in, not all the units had been sold. So there were a couple of years where things were a little dicey, um, but eventually everything sold. Um, Conk and Maury, I mean, what I find is interesting, and I, I cannot answer this question, but I'm interested in how many of these communities are started by women mm -hmm. um, at, you know, Konkanmori and Keyside Village, key are women uh, who have been politically active. And I'll tell you about Konkanmori in a second, but just as a side sequence, when I was um, looking for a research site in Japan, one of the places I went to is this place called Konohana family, which is near Fujisan, it's an eco village. And there, I was there with like two other visitors. So they had a little orientation for us. And most of the people who live there are women. And so this one guy who was visiting from China said, well, I'm curious about that. You know, why do you, why do you think that is? Um, and he then went on to say that in his view, women benefit less from the status quo and so might be more interested in trying some alternative, um, especially women who have kids kids to look after. So I think it's an interesting question uh, to, it would be an interesting question to explore the gendered aspects of how these communities emerge. Certainly at Keyside Village and Konkan Mori, it's very gendered in terms of who runs the show. 
right? Who, who runs the community? Anyway, Conk and Mori, sorry, that was a long side sequence. Um, Conk and Mori, um, Sakamoto-san, and um, a woman who has um, since died, uh, Yukiko Uchida, who was considered the, the mother of co-housing in Japan. She did her master's degree at Cornell and studied co-housing in Sweden for her, her for her thesis and was very interested in starting uh, co-housing because in Japan post-war Japan had been quite organized quite uh, collectively um, up until po post-war and then with the occupation all these American ideologies of individualism took hold changes in the economic structure. So the people were not working in the same place for their entire careers, but were moving around and moving away from their families. So collectivism was no longer organic. And so had to, she, as she said to me, I got to spend a day with her uh, several months before she died, had to be deliberately organized. And so she brought this idea back to Tokyo. She was friends with Sakamoto-san. They actually advertised um for to get people interested and then got a group of people interested and went through the same process and it took them several years it took keyside village several years uh one of keyside's members kathy mcgrenera who i mentioned earlier has been a paid consultant for uh two communities in vancouver driftwood which is just up the street here in north van and little mountain which is over town and they tend, tend to take like three to five years from start to finish, um, especially if you're having to buy a piece of land, build a building, so on and so forth. I don't know, that was a kind of long-winded meandering answer to your question. I hope I answered it adequately. You definitely did. Thank you so much. Okay, any other? Uh, Nikki, yeah. That was a fascinating presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I just wonder how um, how newcomers or potential newcomers are vetted because there is a, an existing community and we all know what happens in departments, for example. Newcomers <laughs> can be integrated or yes. you know, existed yeah. um, and it's it's rarely seamless. Um, yes, so, yeah. yep, yeah. And as we also know from departments that the impression we get from somebody in a job interview can be very different from how things play out yeah. uh, once, they're, once they're there. Um, the only formal vetting process at Konkan Mori is you have to uh, meet, uh, you know, the economic requirement. You have to be able to pay, you know, meet the, the financial requirements to pay rent. There is, um, well, no, it's, 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 no, sorry. It's formalized. I'm mixing up Konk and Mori and Keyside Village. So, in addition to the economic requirement at Konk and Mori, there are there's an orientation once a month for anybody who's just remotely interested in in uh, co housing. And that orientation, they get a you know they learn about the values and they get a tour of the building. But then there's another orientation for people who are interested in moving in, and there they learn all about. Uh, you know, the committees and how the place operates. People come to a common meal um, at that time. But there is no formal process for turning somebody down. Um, what tends to happen if there's an apartment available and somebody wants to move in and they've gone through the orientations and they've come to the common meals, they can move in. Um, but what tends to happen is if, if things don't work out, they'll move out quite quickly. If they move in and discover that they're actually not co-housers, they tend to leave um, in short order. Um, Keyside Village is much more informal. Obviously, there's the economic requirement. You have to be able to buy the unit. There are four affordable units. We only have one rental unit. And it's an affordable rental unit. Um, there is no formal vetting process buyers are you know potential buyers are invited to come to a common meal there was a case however where somebody was selling their unit and 
the people who were interested in buying it came to a common meal and it became clear to people at the common meal that these were not co-housers, that they were more interested in a kind of investment property. So people went to the seller and said, we don't want you to sell to this person. We'd like you to keep looking. And they did keep looking and, and eventually sold it to somebody else. But again, the decision in the end rests with, with the owner. So there is no real official refusal of potential members, but there is an effort in both cases, more formal in Kankamori, less formal at Keyside Village, to educate potential residents of you know what this place is like so that they can kind of self-select out if it becomes clear that you know they're really not interested in being part of a co-housing community. Any other questions? Nikki, another one? Or are you still just, just to follow up, I'm just I'm wondering whether that informality works relatively well at least at the moment because the groups are relatively small uh that's entirely possible yeah um yeah i mean i can't i can't answer that because i haven't done research in in much larger uh co-housing communities although you know you can conjecture that a, a larger community would have more space for divergence in terms of you know how engaged people are in the community, so on and so forth, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe you could mention what proportion at uh, Keyside are male as opposed to female or like, is there a gender split that? Big time in both places, the vast majority of residents are women, vast majority. Um, and I even have, a, I can give you ac actual numbers from when I was doing the project. So I stopped field work uh, in 2018. So t -t 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 um, hold on here. At, sorry, I'm just trying to find this. At Kankan Mori, there were, uh, among the adults, 18 women and three men. Uh, Keyside Village, at the time of the research, there were, hold on just a second here. Just trying to get the actual numbers. Okay. <laughs> They're, okay, I'm just going to do it off the top of my head. So the men at Keyside, there's one, two, three, four, five, five men, and the rest are women. Yeah. So, and, and interestingly enough, at Konkan Mori, there are two men who, who are single men who moved in on their own. Um, the rest including all the men here at Keyside Village, moved in with partners. Some moved in to be with partners and were not co-housers initially. And the stories that people tell me in both places is that when couples moved in, it was women who initiated the move uh, and men who kind of came along for the ride. <laughs> and actually, okay, I'm going to, this is like, just a side sequence, but I find it quite amusing. The the one of the places that I went to, that place near Fujisan that I mentioned a couple minutes ago, I met some women there, elderly women, three or four of them, who moved in with their husbands, and then their husbands didn't like it, and they left and went back to their old apartments. But the women stayed. The women <laughs> stayed, but they would go back to their their husbands' apartments once or twice a year to wait for it, clean and organized for them, right? But they wanted to stay, they were like, okay, you don't want to live here. You can go home, I'm staying. <laughs> Christina. Hi, sorry, I can't use the little thing because I'm actually hosting the meeting, but that completely jives with uh, an experience I had. And I noted, you you said the reevaluation of life as a whole. And I thought of, um, Okay, I was quite involved with the Vancouver co-housing group 
they have the community on uh, 33rd Street East. And uh, but I left the group for various reasons. And years later, I bumped into a woman from the group on the street. And I said, well, how do you like it? What's life like there? Oh, she said she'd left. And, and she left her husband and kids. And she wasn't the only one. She said quite a few couples had split up after huh. moving into co-housing because one of the partners decided they didn't need the other one anymore because they felt so oh. supported by the community. Oh, oh. Yeah. Very interesting. I, I didn't have a chance to go in depth in the conversation. If you were still right, doing right, field work, right. you might find it interesting to study that thread. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you yeah. tell us more about your book? Um, okay, so the book, I was trying as an academic who eventually got tired of writing for other academics, mm -hmm. um, I was trying to write a book that was uh, more accessible uh, to a wider audience. And I was very deliberately setting out to make this a very collaborative project because co-housing is about collaboration. So I thought the research needed to be collaborative. Mm -hmm. And so uh, people in both communities were heavily involved in setting the direction of the research. Um, and I bought each community a GoPro. And so they did filming. So there's a bunch of film, sh film shorts attached to the book. Um, most of which were were taken by by residents. And then the highlight of the collaborative aspect was somehow getting Shirk to fund me bringing people to visit each community. So uh, I think, think I mentioned earlier, I brought three people from Keyside to Konkanmori and a family of four from Konkanmori to Keyside. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that that would be it was kind of a, it was kind of an elaborate elicitation device in the sense that when people step out of their own community and go to another one, it places into relief what they take for granted, right? So they they learned about what they take for granted. They learned about how things are done differently and also similarly in another place. So it gave them a real um, opportunity to kind of evaluate in a very explicit way their own community. And it was also a lot of fun because each community, as I told them, I was doing research in both. They wanted to learn about the other one. Mm -hmm. um, and so both communities got exposed to the other community in a very in a very direct way. And then, you know, collaboration also with the film shorts, I put them together, but then people were heavily involved in choosing ones and the sequence for the film shorts. Uh, everybody saw drafts of the book, so on and so forth. So it was, um, yeah, it was my attempt at, at a collaborative process that would produce something that could travel outside of academic circles. Thank you. It's a great read, as I was telling people at the beginning. It's, Thank uh, you. it's very, very informative and very well written. And you bring the characters to life. <laughs> That's what anthropologists are supposed to do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're almost out of time. Um, my global question, which I held in reserve, was um, to ask Catherine um, how, it, how it changed when she actually, instead of just studying those communities, actually joined up with one of them. Yeah, yeah. What changes involved? So... Um, well, I obviously, you know, changed from being a researcher to being a participant. So I didn't always have to remain neutral anymore. Um, so I, I became more vocal um, in what I think. Um, to my great, um, I'm relieved, to my great relief, uh, what I have observed since moving in has not altered uh my analysis so basically it would it, it kind of has supported what i what i say in the book so I, i'm really glad that i didn't miss anything big but what i have found fascinating and it's a real learning experience for me because i i am not was not a natural co-houser right what i find fascinating is the relationships here are 
familial in the sense that there people can have like major conflict with each other and then do something together just fine. Like, you know, I've had some major conflicts with some of my siblings, but then at Christmas time we get together and we love each other. And I remember being really surprised here where there was some like down and dirty, nasty conflict between two people that was like very public. And then two weeks later, they're they're having a meal together. And I thought, wow, you know, because like in academic departments, you have falling outs and then you just don't talk to each other anymore. Right. So so those kind of dynamics I find very interesting. And in terms of my own adjustment, I've had to learn to pay more attention. Okay, so so like you go in the laundry room and I would just go take care of my own laundry. But I noticed that I go in the laundry room and somebody else is there and they see the common room laundry, they'll take it out and fold it and put it away. And that never would have occurred to me because I'm just in there doing my laundry. And so I've had to learn to, to just, you know, people who lived here for, for 10 or 20 years, they just automatically do stuff. They'll go in the common room and they'll just think to open the dishwasher and empty it if it's clean. Or if there's laundry that needs to be folded, they'll just automatically think of doing that. I've actually had to learn to do that. So it's learning to be less kind of, uh, self-referential, less uh, uh, individualistic. And that's been very interesting to me hmm. to watch myself kind of learn that. Hmm. Yes, Alison. Uh, yeah, you use this, you use the term, Catherine, describing yourself as not a natural co-houser. So I'm wondering how you would define um natural co-houser like what attributes or personality care or those kind of things yeah see as um, particular suited right so uh i'll give one kind of extreme example here uh kathy mcgrenera who is you know one of the founding members she i mean she's an extreme example she has no ego she um, is not, she pays much more attention to others' needs than her own. Uh, um, by natural co-houser, I don't mean that you're, you, you know, you're not an individual or self-interested anymore. Something is echoing. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I think a natural co-houser may not be a born co-houser, but something that is, is learned. Um, and I think you learn, like what I've had to learn is to attend more to the people around me and to their needs, to attend more to the needs of the building, to just have a, a wider radar. Um, huh, it's, yeah, I, yeah, it, there's not like, a a stereotype you have to learn to compromise although you know i remember somebody at konkan mori saying to me that you have to also be a strong individualist to live in a co-housing community because you have to know where to draw your boundaries right um somebody like kathy is fine with her daughter's friends stopping in to use the bathroom on her way home other people here would not be so people draw their boundaries uh, quite differently, but I think I think the characteristics are you have to be willing to compromise. You can't always get things your way. Um, you have to have a certain tolerance for things taking time uh, to be debated and discussed and disagreed over and then compromised on and decided. Uh, patience, um, but it's also, uh, I think, a, a natural co-houser or somebody who learns to be a co-houser is really, in, I really enjoy the differences among people and learning about people's different ways of being in the world. It's kind of fascinating. And you have to, like, 
you know, people can be more private, but you can't be a, a total recluse and live in co-housing. Otherwise, you're not really participating in the community or getting the benefits of the community. So I remember somebody at Conk and Mori saying to me, yeah, you have to, you know, cook a common meal once a month, but, you know, 10 other times during the month, you get to come home from work and for 500 yen, you have this wonderful meal with these wonderful people, right? So there's a, it's like really mutually supportive um, in that sense and a lot of fun. So I think a diehard introvert wouldn't do well in, in co-housing. Um, and somebody who was excessively individualistic um, would also not fit in so well. So I don't really think I answered your question. I'm kind of circling around it. No, I, th I think I think you did. I think you answered it uh, pretty well, actually. Uh, you know, um, and then I'm wondering, this isn't really a question to you, but I guess to all of us, to what extent do people who um, have those characteristics you, you describe as helpful self-select to be part of a community. Right. You know. That's mm -hmm. actually a really good question. And then the and then the other thing is, you know, I mentioned earlier that people people talk about how they changed after moving into co-housing. And uh, what's her name? Lucy Sargason, who's done a lot of work on co-housing communities writes about how co-housing communities, um, you know, you, you establish not only a building and a space, but also a set of procedures. What, how are we governing ourselves? What are our kind of informal policies, so on and so forth. And one of the things she, she writes about is how co-housing communities set things up to encourage people to become what they would like people to be like in co-housing. So, you know, we have common meals. So that's encouraging people to share food and to cook together and share their life stories. You uh, you share resources. So that also encourages sharing. Um, so so the kind of values are, are in a way aspirational. And then, you know, people move into co-housing and adapt and like I have been and I'm becoming a more uh, aware of other people's needs person, right, on a kind of day to day basis. So you you change, right? People reevaluate their lives, but they also kind of shift in who they are, who they are over time. At well, least that's people report to me and that's my ex what my experience has been in the last like two and a half years since I've moved in. Well, it's been a wonderful, fabulous discussion. Um, just quickly, uh, and I'll let people know that the January meeting will be meeting someone from Cranberry Commons, which oh. is another uh, old co-housing um, model. But thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. Very welcome. Is that Renee who you're meeting in January? Sorry? Is it Renee from Cranberry Commons? No, no. Oh, okay. No. Okay, it's never mind. Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your questions, and thanks to Snezia for inviting me, and thanks to Christina for dealing with the slides. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody.